And so today we have the pleasure of having uh, Stefano Deccio. Um, he's a PhD student at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology under the supervision of um, Eugenia Malinikova. And he will speak about another set of Steklov eigenfunctions. Um, Stefano, the stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk and thank you for the introduction. It's, um, let, me, let me start. So I'm gonna talk about nodal sets or zero sets or circle of eigenfunctions. So first, uh, you don't need me to tell you in this audience what circle of eigenfunctions are, but I'm gonna, gonna remind you what I'm considering here. So I'm gonna take a bounded domain in Rn omega. And I'm going to assume that it is Lipschitz. A cyclo problem is uh, to find uh, some uh, function mu in the subtle space uh, H1 of omega and some parameter lambda, which is a real number such that uh, u is a harmonic function in, in the domain. And then the, the norm of the derivative of u is equal to uh, lambda u on the boundary. And then one can show that there is a discrete sequence of uh, eigenvalues, uh, which is uh, accumulated into infinity and they're positive. The first eigenvalue is zero and the eigenfunctions are constants. And uh, in the Lipschitz domain, you should interpret this in a, in a weak sense to say that the integral over the domain omega of the inner product of the gradients is equal to lambda, the integral over the boundary of the product of uh, u and v for any v in H1 of omega. So this is the problem. And uh, now I'm gonna record a, an observation, which I actually I'm not gonna use in this talk at all, but uh, this is uh, this is an important thing and this is part of the reason why people care about cycle of eigenfunctions, I think is that is um, if you take a cycle of eigenfunction and you restrict it to the boundary of omega, then this is an eigenfunction of the Dirichlet to Neumann operator. Uh, now it's, Usually the Dirichlet to Neumann operator is studied on, under its smoother condition in which, uh, uh, in which case it's, it's nicer, but I'm not gonna use it in this talk. What I'm interested in, in is the zero set of u, which I'm gonna denote the Z zero of u, which is uh, just uh, yeah, the set of points in omega where u is equal to zero. And the question is, uh, how does this zero set look like? A couple of uh, very simple observation is that if um, lambda is not zero, then the zero set is, is not active. And then uh, another observation is that um, the maximum principle implies that uh, every component of the zero set intersects the boundary. Right? There are no closed components inside omega. Mm, now I'm gonna, I wanna look at, um, at some examples, some, some uh, very, very easy examples to try to gauge some more information and to maybe define the kind of questions we wanna ask. So I'm gonna start with a very, very easy example, which is just a unit ball in R2. Unit ball in R2, and I, I take this harmonic function, one of the simplest harmonic function you can think of, uh, just um, U, which is, uh, R to the k cosine k theta. And then, um, well, this is, this is the harmonic and then uh, it's an immediate calculation that this also satisfies uh, the cycle of condition on the boundary with, that, with eigenvalue lambda, which is equal to k. Okay, now here I drew the ball and I drew the, the zero set in this light blue. The zero set is uh, just propagating from the zero set of the cosine on the boundary. So it is connecting the origin to the boundary. And uh, here we're talking about cosine k theta. So of course there's um, on, even on the boundary, the, the zeros are spaced at most a constant one over k. And this keeps on being true in the interior. We can see that every ball of radius uh, which is about one over lambda in this unit ball contains the zero of the function u. And in this example, it's also true that if you take, uh, if you consider the boundary of the ball, then the new is just uh, 
it's just a port called sine k theta, which is uh, which is a Laplace eigenfunction on the boundary circle with uh, with eigenvalue k squared. Okay, this is uh, this is interesting, and uh, well, one of these things is uh, it is not true in more general situation, and we're gonna see it immediately with my second example, which is uh, which is a rectangle in R two this time. Yeah, take the rectangle minus pi pi times minus one one for simplicity, and uh, this harmonic function, which is uh, sine of alpha x, the hyperbolic cosine of alpha y. Now this is harmonic, and uh, it's uh, you can calculate that uh, it also satisfies a Stegler condition on the boundary with eigenvalue lambda, which is alpha hyperbolic tangent of alpha. And of course, it, it, it's a discrete sequence. So the alpha, alpha is subject to some constraint. It's a discrete sequence uh, given by a sort of trigonometric hyperbolic equation. Um, what's, uh, what's matter is that uh, this eigenvalue is, is, is very close to, is quite close to alpha if alpha is, is large enough. And again, the zeros are just the zeros of sine. And they're, they're space that, um, at like constant uh, over lambda. So again, in this even in this case, we see that um, if we if we take a ball of radius uh, approximately one over lambda inside the rectangle, then uh, then it contains uh, then it contains a zero of u. But note another thing that in this case it is very very different from our previous example, where zeros were like sort of uh, also densely distributed on the boundary as well. In this case, what happens is that if you take these two sides of the rectangle, then there are no zeros at all. So this is uh, this is quite different, and uh, it's it seems to be that uh, when you have corners, these these things uh, happen. So the rectangle is not the only example. Great, but. Um, Again, basing uh, not very many cases, just two examples. It might seem be it might seem reasonable to ask whether it is true still that um, any ball of radius constant over lambda in uh, in, in omega contains a zero of e. Right, and this question was actually asked. Uh, it was um, it, it's uh, it's written in this way in, uh, in a survey by by Giroir and Polterovich, which appeared at least on the archive in two thousand fourteen. That's that's where I found it in writing at least. And um, right, so this is a question I'm interested in. And let me just remark that if you ask analysis question for uh, for both on in the boundary, this is only possibly true under some uh, global regularity assumptions. So you cannot have corners. And the only instance I know that this is true is for simply connected. Um, Smooth, not necessarily infinity, but with some smoothness, uh, simply connected domains in the plane. And this is an old; it follows from an old result of Shamma. It's uh, seventy-one. Um, it it might be there is something else. I I'm not really aware of it. Okay, so I'm mainly interested in the um, not in the boundary question, but in the interior question, and it's. Uh, it may come as a surprise that actually, if you if you ask it in this way, then this is this is false. But um, okay, yeah, maybe I'll uh, for saying why it is false. Let me, apart from the example, this question is also inspired by the analogous uh, sort of question for Laplace eigenfunctions. For Laplace eigenfunction on a compact Riemannian manifold. Uh, which uh, can be with or without boundary, it doesn't matter for this question. So you take solutions to the Laplace uh, M phi plus lambda phi equals zero on the manifold. And then in this, for Laplace eigenfunction, it is true that any ball of radius constant over square root of the eigenvalue contains the zero of the eigenfunction phi if, if you take this constant large enough. Right, and note that you know, squ square root of lambda here is the same as lambda p for it's, it's the right scale. And this is uh, this is sort of one of the basic properties of Laplace eigenfunctions, and there are several possible uh, proofs of it. So I guess that that's also an inspiration to ask the same question for cyclop eigen for cyclop eigenfunctions. But as I uh, 
inadvertently anticipated is actually false. And uh, this is a recent article that appeared last year by, by Bruno and Galkowski, which uh, says, I'm, uh, I hope I'm not making too much of a disservice to the result, which is uh, actually says more, but I'm gonna paraphrase it simply for my purposes. And um, one of the things it says is that there are, you can find boundless simply connected domains in R2, even with real analytic boundaries, for which you have stack of eigenfunctions with large eigenvalue that do not change sign in balls of uh, fixed radius, or in balls of lambda independent radius inside the domain. This, this, this was a lot of words, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a picture that uh, I, Basically, I, I copied it from that paper, I, from one of the pictures they have in that paper. And the, what happens is this. And so you have a domain, which is actually, it's actually quite close to a ball. And I drew again the, the zero set in blue. And what happens is that the, the zero set, if you're not on a ball, it sort of uh, seems like it, it retracts towards the boundary. And then you have a stack of eigenfunctions with large eigenvalue which are say positive in uh, this, this red ball example that I drew, which is, uh, which is a radius that is not dependent on lambda. In some sense, the stack eigen function do not really oscillate much in the interior. And this is, uh, well, that the result of Bruno and Galkowski says exactly this, and actually they, they say more, they, they basically say that in the interior, uh, stack of eigen function with high, eigen, with high eigenvalue can be fairly well approximated with uh, basically functions with only boundedly many non-zero Fourier modes. And, um, well, the, the, again, allow me to, I hope I'm not doing too much of a disservice, but allow me to say what I, like how I think of this result is uh, I'm gonna go back to the examples of a ball that I had. But here you have a ball and you have the zero set that, um, that goes everywhere, that keeps on being dense in the interior. And note that though this, this, this function is, is exponentially small in the interior. And this keeps on being true, this exponential smallness keeps on being true for more general situations, that for the, in particular for the ones that Bruno and Galkowski consider. But, uh, but the zero set gets destroyed. This, the zero set in the interior gets destroyed as soon as you take uh, as, even a slight perturbation of the boundary then the zero set is, uh, is sort of pushed away from the center and, and goes towards the bottom. This is my way of saying this. No, okay, now this, um, this is just a drawing that I made here, so you might, you might not believe it as well, but um, I, I could be lying, but in that paper, they actually have um, some uh, numerics and they have, uh, computer generated pictures that really look like this. So it seems that um, at least when I look at this picture, not, not all the hope is lost because uh, it seems like that really the, the zeros, there's a lot of zeros near the boundary, I guess. You cannot, you cannot get the, the zeros, those oscillations in the interior, but you can get them near the boundary. And you can prove something like this. I'm gonna state it as a theorem in this way. I can say that uh, there is a, some constant that depends on the domain, such that for, I take any point x, z, x naught in the boundary of omega, and I take any ball centered at x naught of radius this constant over lambda. And then this ball has a non-empty intersection with the zero set. Here's a pictorial depiction of this. This is, a, this is a local argument. And then uh, this is a question I will come back to uh, in a bit, in a few minutes. Mm, it's a thing I don't know, is that um, if this result still holds true in a fixed size cooler neighborhood of the boundary. So here, basically, I sort of have some, uh, some shrinking set. Some, uh, I have this scale constant over lambda, which goes quicker towards the boundary as lambda increases. But I would like to know if if some result, some density of the zeros is still true in a fixed size polar neighborhood boundary. I'm gonna talk a bit more about this in, 
in a second. So now, once you once you formulate the, the the problem and you ask the question in this way, it's actually it's actually quite short to prove. So I'm gonna give you a sketch of the proof. So I'm gonna assume that uh, that u is uh, is greater than zero in some uh, in some ball of radius r center centered at a point in the boundary. And I'm gonna assume that I'm gonna take this r to be much smaller than one. Consider this set W, which is just the intersection of this ball with the, with the original domain omega. Okay. Now I'm gonna, I take R small enough. So this is a, this is a, a nice set. It's a kind of, it's not too far from a half ball. I'm gonna call F the, the part of the boundary of omega, which is in the ball. And then I'm gonna call S the part of the boundary of the ball, which is in omega. If I know you have a question, it's uh, Alex. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, are you assuming more than Lipschitz in this part? I'm not. So how can you assume that it is like a half ball? Maybe there is a corner there, no? Yeah, the corners are also fine. Okay. okay. When, when it, 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 this, this symbol is very imprecise. It's, okay. Uh, it, it, there will be, a, later on, I will have to assume more than Lipschitz, but here it's fine. It's, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and uh, I'm going to consider an auxiliary boundary value problem in this new domain W, which is a, a mixed uh, stack of Dirichlet problem in, uh, in W. So you have a question. How does this theorem relate to the rectangle example given earlier? Um, Well, there's, um, if you, let me go back to the rectangle. Right, the rectangle basically says that uh, it's true that in the rectangle, I don't have zeros on the boundary, but I take, I take a point on the boundary, and then I take a, a ball of radius uh, from a constant over lambda on the point, and as you see, I still find zeros. This distance is like one over lambda. I don't know if I answered that question. Let me go, let me move forward if there are no objections. Um, so I'm gonna consider this mixed uh, Steklov Dirichlet problem in W. So it's a harmonic function in W, which is zero on this part of the boundary and which satisfies a Steklov condition on this other part of the boundary. And again, you can show that uh, this, this has been done before, that uh, there is a discrete sequence of eigenvalues accumulating to infinity, much like the cycle of problem. And I'm gonna call sigma one the first eigenvalue of this problem, which in, in this case, it's not zero. And uh, an important lemma, which is uh, easy, it's easy, but needs to be proved, is that if, uh, if I take these, these R sufficiently small, then the first eigenvalue is less than a constant divided by r. Now, when I use these in this uh, in the following way, I take the first eigenfunction of this problem corresponding to eigenvalue sigma one, and I'm going to set b equal to h squared. Then v has some nice property: it's uh, both the v and its normal derivative are zero on on s. And then it's again satisfies a sort of cycle of condition on F with two sigma one and its Laplacian is positive. Now you you do basically Green's formula or weak version of it. I just I wrote it with the Laplacians. And then uh, what you get is um, you just uh, you plug it in. What you get is that um, lambda minus two sigma one should be less than zero. And then by by this uh, by this lemma, you get a condition on R, which should be less than constant over lambda. So the radius of this ball centered at the boundary where the function is positive has to be smaller than some constant over lambda, which is uh, which is what I was stating before. And now I come back to the question that I that I mentioned before. The thing I'm um, 
I would be interested to know that I don't know. So you take, um, you, you can assume now, but maybe to help intuition that in this case, the boundary is, is smoother. So the distance from the boundary is a nicer function. So you have, um, you have a smooth boundary, say. And then you take a color neighborhood of some width uh, delta, which is very small around the boundary. But I want this delta independent of lambda. And then inside this color neighborhood, you take uh, you take balls of radius constant over lambda, right? centered at any point inside this color neighborhood. And my question is, can I still find zeros of u there in any such ball? And it, it seems like the method doesn't apply. So it's, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is true. It's, um, I don't really know. I'm not good in numerics. I don't know how to do numerics. It would be interesting for me to, to know how to do that and to actually see some uh, simulations of, like very large eigenvalue and see actually if these uh, zeros get closer and closer to the boundary or if they stop at some point. It seems that at least it's theoretically the possibility of, of this being true is left open by the by the negative result of Bruno and Galkowski. But, but I don't know how to prove it. I would I believe it's true, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna move to the second part of, of the talk, which concerns um, lower bounds on the measure and um, using using this first part. And now I cannot I cannot talk about measure bounds without without talking about the a famous conjectural fiao for Laplace eigenfunctions, which is the inspiration of much much work. So again, I take the um, considered Laplace equation on a compact many manifold, and there is a famous conjectural fiao which says that the n minus one also also measure of the zero set of phi should be bounded above and below by some constant square root lambda. And this has inspired really a lot of work. The, um, I'm gonna mention uh, only basically two things and there's, uh, there's much more in between, but for time reason, I will just do that. Um, so the first uh, thing I'm gonna mention is that if the metric on M is real analytic, then the Yao's conjecture is true. This was done by Donnelly and Pfefferman back in 88. And then in the years that followed, there have been uh, some uh, partial results and a significant um, improvement uh, uh, happened in 2016 by Sasha Lobunov. He showed that for um, C infinity, and then if, if you look at his proof, it actually holds for, for C2 metric, then the lower bound is true. So it showed this. And he also, he also gave a polynomial upper bound, so polynomial in the, in the eigenvalue, which, uh, which is to date, as far as I know, the best result we have also for upper bound. So the lower bound is, is sharp, even in this most case. And now I'm gonna, I'm looking at these, you can, um, you can conjecture the same sort of for, um, for cycle of uh, eigenfunctions. This, uh, again, this, uh, this you can find explicitly in the survey that I mentioned before by Jibar and Polterovich. And the conjecture in this case is that the n minus one hours of measure of the zero set of a stack of eigenfunction is, uh, is bounded above and below by some constant times lambda, times the eigenvalue. Now I have, uh, I need, I mentioned a string of results in that. And um, you can note that there's no, in this case, of, this was not considered uh, in the eighties or nineties uh, to my knowledge. So the, the results are all much recent. So I'm gonna start with the first, maybe the, the best result available which is um, in two dimension. When the boundary is real analytic, then the conjecture is true. This was proved by Paul Tarovich, uh, Sharon Toth in 2015. And then for, for any dimension, again, under a real analytic boundary hypothesis, the upper, the upper bound is shown to be true by, by Zoo. And uh, essentially by following the arguments of uh, Donnelly and Pfefferman for the Laplace eigenfunction points. Then there's also in the C infinity or C2 case, there's a, there's a polynomial upper bound, which, um, which uh, mimics again, the, the polynomial upper bound of Sasha Lobinov for Laplace eigenfunctions. This was uh, Georgiev and uh, Roy Fortan in 2017. 
And then there's a, there's a lower bound again in the, in the smooth case by some constant times lambda to the two minus n divided by two. So again, this is, this is not optimal. Uh, this is not the conjecture optimal in any dimension and uh, for n greater than two, it decays with lambda. This was uh, Sog, uh, Wang and Zhu in 2015. Um, let me, okay. Uh, I wanna mention a bit about the, the strategy to prove lower bounds. I'm gonna concentrate on lower bounds now. And this strategy to prove lower bound, at least in the Laplace eigenfunctions case, was um, was proposed by Nadir Shvili. So you ask a question, which is um, take a harmonic function in the unit ball, which is zero as zero at the center of the ball. The question is to prove that the n minus one half of measure of the zero set of u inside the ball is bounded from below by a constant which does not depend on u. And then if you, if you knew this, then a rescaling of this thing, time plus the density property of the zeros that which holds true for Laplace eigenfunction uh, gives you the lower bound in Yao's conjecture. And this is exactly what Sasha Logunov did. So he proved this conjecture of Nadir Shvili. In other words, there's a, there's a catch. So here I wrote harmonic function. What you really need to prove is not so much harmonic function in the Euclidean sense, but you need to prove it for a, solutions of elliptic PDEs in divergence form with, uh, with no lower order coefficients. This, this, this is what gives you the application then to, to manifolds and to, to Yao's conjecture. But even, even for harmonic functions, uh, for Euclidean harmonic function, this, this was open. And uh, for example, it, it, was, uh, it was unknown for harmonic, function in, uh, for harmonic functions in R3 that, uh, that the zero set has infinite area. And the proof is not significantly simpler if you assume that uh, that you that you're talking about Euclidean harmonic functions rather than solutions to more general elliptic equations. So it's um, it's not an easy question. So I want to I want to follow this strategy now. We have uh, we showed a density property, maybe maybe not optimal, but we have something. And now we would like to follow the strategy to get a lower bound uh, on the zero set. So I'm gonna go back to Stekloff, which I remind you what this is. Again, harmonic functions in the interior of the domain and then uh, normal derivative at the boundary equal lambda function at the boundary. And I'm gonna assume now that, that the boundary is at least C2. And I wanna get rid of the boundary. Mm, there's a procedure to do this. Do you call D of X is the distance from a point X to the boundary omega and say we wanna consider this quite close to the boundary so that the distance function is, is, is quite nice. You define this new function V, which is e to the lambda d times u. And to the best of my knowledge, this, uh, this trick appeared uh, for the first time in, uh, in a paper by Bellova and Lin in 2014. Okay, then you take this new function V and you calculate that it satisfies this, um, this equation. This, L lambda, you can say that it's L lambda V is zero in omega and uh, with a Neumann condition on the boundary of omega. Where L lambda is uh, some elliptic operator which has lower order coefficients, both, both first order and zeroth order coefficient, which depend on lambda, only the lower order coefficients. But you have some good bounds, bounds that you're happy with on, on these lower order coefficients. Now you have this, uh, this auxiliary function satisfies a Neumann condition on the boundary. So what you can do, you can do a, like a, an even reflection across the boundary to get an equation in some open set omega tilde or omega tilde. So now, I mean, I'm, I'm abusing notation here and calling V again, the, either also the, the function and the reflected function. And it satisfies an elliptic PDE in this extended domain. So again, I'm gonna, paraphrase the result of the first part of the talk in, um, in terms of V. So what we found is like a sort of half balls around the boundary of radius uh, constant over lambda with zeros of U. So then we get full balls in this domain omega tilde with zeros of V. Again, balls of radius constant over lambda. 
So now I take I take one of these balls, call it centered at x naught of radius constant over lambda with uh, with the v of x naught which is zero. Okay. So I take uh, I take a ball where uh, v is zero at the center. I'm going to rescale to get an equation in a ball which is uh, lambda independent radius. So I'm going to call v tilde this rescale function, and then v tilde satisfies uh, an equation that I call l v tilde equal to zero in this ball. And then and now l is an elliptic operator with uniformly bounded lower order coefficients, so with, with bounds on lower order coefficients that don't depend on lambda. You can actually get small lower order coefficients. Okay. So I, I got to this, uh, to this is a sort of auxiliary equation. And now I'm gonna, what I wanna do is I wanna replicate the proof of uh, the Logonov's theorem of, Nadir, of Nadir's, Nadirashvili's conjecture for this, uh, for this elliptic operator, which also has lower order terms. The theorem is as follows. So you take a solution of L B tilde equals zero in the ball, such that V tilde is zero at the center of the ball. Then you have that the n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure of the zero set of V tilde in this ball is bounded from below by a constant independent of the function. And again, the, the, so the, I cannot use the theorem of Sasha Logonov directly because this, this operator has, uh, has lower order terms, but um, really the, the ideas are all there. So you need to sort of run the argument again and uh, check that things work. But really a good part of the ideas were, uh, were already present in, in, in Logonov's paper. So once you have these, well, you, you just rescale it back to, to, to these balls of radius constant over lambda to say that the n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure of the zero set of V inside this ball of radius constant over lambda is greater than some constant times uh, lambda to the one minus n. And then again, we found approximately lambda to the n minus one balls with zeros of V because you can place them all around the boundary. And then you sum over these and you get the, the following theorem. Take a cyclic eigenfunction, eigenvalue lambda in a C2 domain omega. And then it's uh, the n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure of the zero set is bounded from below by a constant that depends only on the domain omega and not on the function itself, not in, not in the eigenvalue. So this is, uh, I think as far as I'm aware, this, this is uh, the best lower bound, and, uh, but I'm, I'm off by a power of lambda. So again, let me go back to the, to the conjecture. Right. So the conjecture should have uh, some constant times lambda. And the reason why I cannot get there is this, um, is the fact that the density result that I can show is only really around the boundary in a corona of size uh, constant over lambda, which is, uh, which is uh, why I insisted on this. If I, if I could find like a, like a color neighborhood of uh, lambda independent theta around the boundary with zeros, then the lower bound, the sharp lower bound would follow. But I cannot, I don't know how to do that. So it's, uh, that's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. Okay, uh, I guess I'm, uh, I'm uh, running a bit. So I think I have the time to actually talk about uh, a bit of the proof, which is, uh, I mean, in this case, it's not, um, it's not even really a sketch. It's more like a discussion of some ingredients in the proof and uh, maybe some, some pictures and some cartoons of the proof rather than, than an actual sketch. So I remind you what, what I wanna prove. I'm gonna change notation and what was before V tilde, I'm gonna call it U because writing V tilde is annoying. And um, so U is a solution of uh, L U equals zero in the unit ball, say, where again, L is an elliptic operator with, uh, with lower order coefficients, uh, um, with lower order terms and lower order coefficients are, are small. And you want to show that the n minus one dimensional observed measure of u in a ball is bounded from below by a constant that depends only on the operator L. 
Now, an easy observation is that if, if n is equal to 2, this is just a consequence of the maximum principle. If, um, if the operator L has a small lower coefficients, you have an approximate maximum principle. And again, if you have, a, you have a function that is zero at the center of the ball, then you cannot have small loops inside this ball. So then the length of the zero set has to be greater than the diameter. That, that already proves this in the two-dimensional case. In uh, higher dimension, this is, this is much more difficult. And uh, so uh, a very key ingredient in, in this thing is um, the frequency function, which is a very useful tool in the study of unique continuation property, say, of, um, of elliptic PDEs. As far as I know, this was introduced for, uh, for harmonic functions, at least by, by, by Ungren. And then it was uh, developed uh, by Nicola Garofalo and Fan Walin. In, in my case, the frequency function, uh, I'm going to call it beta at a point x uh, uh, of radius r. So it's um, I'm going to take r times the integral over the gradient square of u. And then I have some lower order terms that depend on the on the lower order coefficients of my operator. So these, uh, these, these are not there in the, if the function is harmonic or if you, uh, if you don't have lower order coefficients. But in my case, they're there, but I'm not going to write them. And then you divide it by the integral over the, the boundary for ball of radius uh, r center to the x of x squared. What is this? Uh, intuitively, this. Uh, this frequency function sort of uh, measures the local degree of, of a solution of an elliptic PDE. Think about harmonic functions, we, we think of them uh, in some senses as polynomials, at least in the best case, think of them polynomials. And uh, here, okay, again, no lower order terms. If you, if you put here a homogeneous polynomial, then you actually get a multiple of the degree of that polynomial. So this frequency function is as a, can be seen as a vast generalization of the degree of a polynomial. And the, there's a the key property this is sort of uh, almost monotonicity, which is proved by Garofalo and Lin. It says that it, um, if you take um, if you take R one, which is less than R two, and it's also small enough, then you have that uh, the frequency function x R one is less than some constant plus another constant times the frequency function in x R two. This is really sort of a very important property that allows you to do things with this frequency. Maybe, maybe more intuitive, a more intuitive measure of the of the growth of solutions to elliptic PDEs is, is the doubling index, more than the frequency function, which is defined as the as the as the log of the soup over a ball of radius two uh, r of u absolute value of u divided by soup over a, a ball of radius r of the absolute value of u. And now the, I'm gonna say this, but uh, please, this is, this, this is wrong. So don't take it at face value. But it, I'm gonna say that informally, the frequency function beta of xr is approximately the doubling index in, in xr. This is not true. Like the R, the R, the R year cannot be the same if you want a precise statement, but uh, I'm not going to insist on this point. But just please, please this, this is not true, but it, it's morally true. Um, so, in some sense, uh, the doubling index, at least I, I view it as a more intuitive measure of growth. Uh, but, uh, but the frequency function is much easier to work with. You can differentiate these terms, you can do, you can do more things. It's uh, working with the ratios of soups is, is a bit harder, I think. But the, the, the property that they're comparable is uh, sort of uh, tells you that you can work with either. Now, just, uh, just a couple of remarks, which are not really important right now, but just to maybe orient some ideas. Uh, you have that if you, in the Laplace eigenfunction case, the doubling index is bounded by some constant times square root of the eigenvalue. This was done by Donnelly and Pfefferman, and it doesn't require real analytic real analyticity. It's true for, uh, for smooth methods. And then there's, a, there's an equivalent, there's a, sorry, a corresponding result in the Sucklov case, which is proved by Zhu, that tells you that the doubling index is, is bounded by some constant times lambda. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, now with this terminology, it's easy. Uh, maybe maybe not super easy, but it's uh, it's not it's not hard to prove um, a sort of a naive lower bound on the measure of the zero set. So again, I take a ball uh, centered at x of 3D star such that u is zero at the center of the ball. And now if you if you bound uh, the doubling index in say center in the ball uh, with the same center of half the radius by some number n. Then you, you can show that the n minus one dimensional rows of measure of the zero set inside this ball of radius r is bounded from below by some constant times the radius to the n minus one times this n to the two minus n. So what you see is that if n is not two, then this bound grows worse as n becomes low. Again, this is uh, this thing is proved, but it's an application of the maximum principle. So it makes sense that if n is equal to two, then this is already sharp. If n is not two, then then this bound seems to get worse when uh, when the doubling index in half the ball increases. But if if you happen if it happens that the doubling index in this uh, half ball is is already bounded uniformly, it's on constant depending only on your operator. Then the, this uh, sort of naive lower bound already proves you the theorem, right? The theorem that we want to prove is uh, is without this. We want a uniform, so we we want only the the radius of the ball to be n minus one. So this maybe suggests you that, uh, that what needs to be done is some sort of induction on the scale line, right? Where uh, this uh, where this bound will play the role of a base case of induction, and then you need to to find something. You need an induction step. Right, you need um, what you need to show is that uh, if if the doubling index increases, actually the the nodals the measure of the nodal set increases rather than decreases. I'm gonna not even this is not a schedule to prove. This is really just a cartoon of uh, what's going on in here. So a, a key tool to to prove uh, this um, this inductive step. Is uh, is uh, some results on the distribution of uh, doubling indices, which were developed by Sasha Logunov, also in parallel in collaboration with Eugenia Malinikova. So the, the general uh, statement, which doesn't have much meaning, it's, it's just that if you take a if you take a cube and you divide it and you divide it into many smaller cubes, then many of the small cubes or most of the small cubes will have a much better doubling index than the original cube. Again, there's a, before I define the doubling index for balls, but you can, you can tweak the definition, get a doubling index for, uh, for cubes, uh, just by defining it as the, as the soup of the doubling indices for uh, balls containing cubes. It's, it's not important. There's a, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a formal statement because this is this is important, uh, which is a, it's a formalization of this idea. So yeah, I have a cube and I divide it into k to the n cubes, which with k which is that is very large. There's a theorem that appears in in one of the papers of uh, Sasha Logonov, which tells you that the number of uh, small cubes with doubling index greater than the doubling index of the original cubes times some constant, which is uh, scary, which is minus uh, log k divided two to the minus log k divided by log log k, then this number is less than k to the n minus one minus c, where c is positive. And this is like the fact that this c is positive is important. And in some sense, it tells you that uh, the number of cubes with, uh, with large doubling index, you could call them uh, bad cubes. And then the number of bad cubes is very small. So then the number, the total number of cubes is k to the n. The number of bad cubes is less than k to the n minus one minus c. And the fact that the, this exponent is less than n minus one, is strictly less than man, n minus one, gives you an indication that this, uh, that this thing is uh, sort of effective at detecting the nodal set. And uh, let me show you how you could use this thing to, to get a, sort of a, a lemma that allows you to do the induction step. And again, I, I drew a cartoon of what's happening. So take um, B is the ball where we want to prove uh, some lower bound for the zero set. 
And now I'm gonna, if you assume that say on, uh, on a quarter of the ball, u is small. So inside here, u is less than one. And uh, on the other end, if uh, the, is the soup on half the ball of u is greater than two to the n with, with some uh, large n. In some sense, uh, what this tells you, uh, what I'm assuming here is that the, the doubling index in, uh, in, in a quarter ball is, uh, is greater than some n. And now what I wanna do is I wanna connect the, the places where the, where the function is small. So here the function is less than one and here the function is large. And I wanna connect this. I denote it in, in red, the maximum point. So where, where u is, is greater than this two to the n. So I'm gonna connect these, these two things with some cylinder and, or large cube. And you wanna divide this, uh, this thing into small cubes that I, that I drew outside the uh, one over square root of n, where n is this number. You, you get approximately square root, uh, square root of n to the, to the small n cubes. And the lemma that you can prove, which is, uh, which is the, the lemma that allows you to do the induction step is that there are uh, many cubes with zeros. Specifically, there are at least the square root of n to the n minus one times, uh, times some big constant, times some big number in n. It, it doesn't matter too much what it is. It, it matters that it's, uh, that it's less than any, than any power of n and is more and is, uh, is more than any power of the log of n. So there are at least square root of n to the n minus one times this large number of cubes qj that contains zeros of u. How would you do such a thing? You you split this this uh, this large rectangle into these uh, these tunnels, these uh, thin rectangles, these uh, thin long rectangles. Tunnels is, is uh, such as terminology for it. What happens in this in these tunnels? You have that uh, in the initial cubes of these tunnels, you have that the function is small, and in the final cube, you can prove that uh, that the function is large, is greater than some two to the c n. Now each tunnel contains approximately square root of n cubes. And you wanna and you wanna pass from a region where u is small, smaller than one, to a region where u is greater than two to the c n. If you use Harnack inequality, then this uh, this tells you that uh, this cannot happen if uh, u doesn't have zeros inside this tunnel, because there's only square root to the n cube, cubes, and. Um, well, the Harnack inequality tells you if you don't have zeros, for example, in two consecutive cubes, then the, the multiplicative increment is, is bounded when you go from a cube to the next. So the, the total sum would be uh, c to the square root of n, which is, uh, which is much smaller than two to the cn, which is the maximum of u there. Right, so the, the use of the Harnack inequality tells you that you need to have zeros in these tunnels. This is not enough because you want you need many zeros. Now you find many zeros is, is this um, doubling index count that I wrote here. Using this, it's it's not immediate, it needs to be done, but using this, you can find that there's actually since the actually in, in most in in, uh, in these cubes here, for most of the time now the function doesn't grow too much. It doesn't grow like n, but it grows much less than n. It's n divided by some large factor. And using this, you can find approximately this, uh, this number, which is basically the same number as before, two to the log n divided by log log n, cubes with zeros of u. And the, this lemon distribution doubling indices tells you that you can do this in at least half of the tunnels. And if you, you think about what this tells you, it proves exactly this thing. So the, the, the number of tunnels is, uh, is this thing. And then in each tunnel, you find these many zeros. And this allows you to do, and this allows you to do induction on scales and, uh, and conclude the proof. Um, let me mention, 
one thing. So it's, um, again, this, uh, this, this, this lower bound relies on, um, okay, this, uh, this is, you first uh, prove some density statement and then you prove some uh, absolute lower bound for some risk scale version of the equation. And I, I'm not sure, I don't know how to, I don't know if there's a way to avoid the, this density. It seems like that uh, the best bound that we have available for uh, the only sharp lower bound I know of for cyclophagin functions is, um, is the one by Polterovich, Sherenthal in, in two dimensional for real analytic boundaries. And in there, it seems like that, uh, I, 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 I confess that I don't have a good understanding of that paper, but it seems like that the density question is avoided. Okay, let me, in the couple of minutes I have less, I'm just gonna mention the, some uh, work in progress on an upper bound. Um, so I, again, I'm, I remind you that I consider um, a bounded domain in Rn with C2 bounded. And now this is an important point. Most of what I said before, actually I, I said a bounded domain in Rn for simplicity, but most of what I said is true for, for a manifold with bound. With say smooth metric inside and I don't know C2 boundary. But uh, here for what I'm gonna tell next, then I really need that, that uh, I, re I really need that this is a domain in Rn, or at least that it's uh, it's, it's real analytic inside. And now I can say that if I take a cyclophagin function, cyclophagin function with lambda, then uh, the n minus one dimensional other measure of a zero set is bounded by some constant that depends on the domain times lambda log lambda. So this is not optimal, but it's, uh, so it's there's, a, there's a log off, but it's, it's not too far from being optimal. And again, this is, this is for Euclidean domains with C2 boundary. Why Euclidean domains? Because this is based on, uh, on using the result of donnelly Pfefferman in the interior of the domain. And this requires the, the metric to be real analytic. Is we don't have the sharp upper bound in uh, in Yao's conjecture for uh, for less than real analytic things. So this is uh, is very crucial in this case. But it's uh, the fact that it's a Euclidean uh, domain is not crucial in what I said before. I think this is uh, I can I can stop here and thank you for for the attention. Thank you, uh, Svano, for the really uh, nice talk today. Uh, do we have uh, any questions? You can either ask them by unmuting your mic or asking them in chat, and I will relay them. Well, I have a quick comment. This is uh, Josef Potter. Hello. Uh, hi, Stefano. So thanks a lot for, uh, uh, for a wonderful talk. Uh, so just a comment about uh, uh, this density in the uh, mm. fixed neighborhood of the boundary. So yeah. I, I believe from our work with uh, David and John, it follows that if you have a simply connected planar domain with a real analytic boundary, mm -hmm. the answer is positive to this question. And basically the way to prove the lower bound is essentially yeah. we're showing that, uh, so you have zeros uh, distributed on the boundary and then you have so the P zero produces a little curve for a fixed sort of time going inside, mm -hmm. th that's how we prove the lower bound. And uh, we don't indeed, we don't write down the density statement, but I think that uh, inspecting the proof of the lower bound in that case should should give the density statement. Yeah, right? I, ha I had the feeling that it was implicit in there somehow, because it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, indeed in high dimensions or, or even in uh, yeah. dimensions, but when you have several, uh, Boundary components. That's already uh, uh, completely it should, should should require some some new ideas. Yeah. Thanks, um, Joseph, for the for the comment. Do we have any other questions for uh, Stefano? All right. I I have a, a question myself. Um, yeah. So in the in the um, upper bound case yeah um 
you 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 basically ask to be a domain in Euclidean space so that you you um, so 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 that you can use Donnelly and and, and mm -hmm. estimate in the interior. Uh, is that a a black box in a sense? In the sense that would any improvement on Yao's conjecture in uh, the Laplacian case give you automatically using the methods you're developing? Uh, better bounds for secular eigenfunctions as well by using them uh, yeah. in the interior. Uh, yeah, it's um, okay. So secular eigenfunctions, you have harmonic functions in the interior, right? And the way that mm -hmm. uh, that the, the the proof of an upper bound uh, usually goes is that you bound the zero set by the frequency mm -hmm. at the interior, and then the Donnelly Feferman gives you a bound on the frequency, which is which is what you want, this constant times square root of the eigenvalue. And this, this works for harmonic functions, right? But the problem is that, yeah, in the smooth metric, we don't have a linear bound in the frequency. Mm -hmm. There's only a polynomial bound, which is the one by log. You know? So if somebody proved uh, improved it to the optimal one, as you say, then it could, it could work as a, as a black box. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And uh, I think if somebody proved the, sorry, this, um, if somebody proved the optimal bound, then, uh, then actually this, this result wouldn't be much interesting because uh, I would assume that the boundary wouldn't matter too much at that point. If you have C2 boundary and somebody proves the, the, the optimal bound, then you can do again this extension tree can get uh, directly the, the optimal bound for stack block as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and and in, in, in the same kind of uh, direction, I was, I was wondering the, the, the results you obtain. Uh, say for the lower bounds, they, they are mm -hmm. specifically for, for secular eigenfunctions there and therefore harmonic. But it seems that the, the, the tools you use uh, were those tools developed for for uh, eigenfunctions as well as at some point. So I, I guess they do, do they work also if you if you look at some sort of uh, parametric um, Dirichlet Neumann map where instead of asking for harmonic functions inside, you ask mm -hmm. for eigenfunction of the Laplacian inside with some eigenvalue lambda, or say mu inside. Uh, that's okay. I think so. Yeah, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, once uh, you, you need to prove like a density statement first, right? Mm -hmm. And this uh, this should be okay, I believe. And then uh, once you once you have a density, then you, you if you. You consider the balls of the appropriate size, where where the function is zero, so that is mm -hmm. radius, which will be constant over whatever the relevant parameter in that case is. And if you if you rescale it, you get like a uniformly elliptic equation with coefficients that don't depend on your parameter anymore. Oh. And once you have a uniformly elliptic equation with lower order coefficients, which are nice bounded, then then you can prove this uh, this result. Oh, okay. I don't know if that answered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is there any other uh, question for the speaker? All right. Well, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again uh, for this talk. And. Um, We'll uh, see everybody again uh, next week for a talk that will be in some sense complementary for this one. Um, Jeff Galkowski will, will uh, talk to us about the interior behavior of stick love eigenfunctions. So see you everybody uh, on next week and thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Stefano. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you.